Today on Trial Watch, Billy Joel accuses his manager, his daughter's godfather, of ripping him off to the tune of 30 million bucks. We're going into the red. He was on trial for murder when his attorney introduced a surprise witness, a two-year-old burrito. Which, as far as I was concerned, proved conclusively our alibi. All this and more today on Trial Watch. And hello, everyone. I'm Rob Weller. And I'm Lisa Specht. Welcome to Trial Watch. Pop star Billy Joel accuses his former manager of stealing $30 million from him. Now, it's bad enough that the manager used to be Billy's brother-in-law, but he's also the godfather of Billy Joel's daughter. All right, in a moment, Billy will be out. He'll be making a statement, then we'll open it up for a question and answers. Billy? When Billy Joel's manager, Frank Weber, introduced Billy at a 1987 press conference, he may have unwittingly been signaling the beginning of the end. They were announcing Billy's upcoming tour in Russia. And when someone asked how much money they expected to make, Frank's answer was ironic. Did you want to answer that? <laughs> None. No. It's, it's, it's going in, we're going into the red. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I, fortunately, I, I can afford to do this. Can you do it? I don't know. Till I get up there. As it turned out, Billy would later be quoted saying, Frank made more money documenting and producing the tour than Billy made performing. Two years later, Billy not only fired Frank Weber, but sued him and others for $90 million. It all started when Frank and Lucille Weber became friendly with Billy in the 70s. Frank's sister, Elizabeth, was Billy's wife. Soon after, Billy made his wife his manager. She hired her brother Frank away from his job in aerospace marketing to take over the business side of Billy Joel. A few years later, uh, Mr. Joel asked Mr. Weber to take over sole responsibility for his management. And uh, the then Mrs. Joel, Elizabeth Weber, uh, consented. And the relationship between Billy Joel and Frank Weber continued. During this long period of time, Mr. Weber made very many successful financial investments on behalf of Mr. Joel. Well, our contention is that he really didn't uh, know very much about the entertainment business, uh, that he originally came in to handle uh, Billy's business affairs, and then when his sister, who had been Billy's wife, uh, divorced uh, Billy, he then took over all aspects of uh, Billy's career. Uh, our position is that he really didn't do anything to benefit Billy. Frank's management continued, despite Billy and Elizabeth's divorce, some of which Frank helped negotiate. Attorneys for Joel say Billy trusted Frank implicitly, even naming him godfather after the singer and his new wife, Christy Brinkley, gave birth to daughter Alexa. Billy trusted him completely. He was not only his brother-in-law, he was the godfather of Billy's only child. Uh, they were very close personal friends. He sided with Billy during the uh, divorce that Billy went through. Uh, Billy gave him power of attorney. He wrote every check uh, for any financial transaction that Billy ever had, and um, he re represented him for over nine years. During those nine years, Joel charges a 1989 audit shows Weber grossly misused Billy's money, issuing loans of up to a million dollars to himself and wife Lucille while signing Billy's name to them using the power of attorney. Some loans, mostly from record companies, were secured with copyrights from Billy Joel's songs. And many of those copyrights are still mortgaged. He also invested millions of dollars of Billy's money in companies that he controlled in the horse, oil and gas, and real estate fields, all of which went down the tubes and Billy was out huge quantities of money. In virtually every instance, when um, Mr. Weber made investments or loans on behalf of Mr. Joel. These loans were approved prior thereto by Mr. Joel at the periodic meetings that were held by Mr. Weber and Mr. Joel, at which time Mr. Weber would bring Billy Joel up to date on all of his uh, business affairs. But Billy's attorney, Leonard Marks, says stars like Billy are particularly susceptible to ripoffs which is often why they turn to family members for business help in the first place. Marx is no stranger to courtroom battles between celebrities and managers, 
having handled such cases for Eddie Murphy and others. Billy, I don't believe, graduated from uh, high school. Uh, he certainly has no financial training or background of any kind. This fellow uh, was the uh, general partner of various horse breeding enterprises, uh, which were very speculative. He put a lot of Billy's money into these horse breeding partnerships. They all lost money. Uh, and then when he was losing money, he would borrow additional monies uh, from Billy uh, and put that into the horse breeding partnerships all the time, according to the complaint, telling him that these were fabulously successful when, in fact, uh, now they're uh, completely uh, underwater. You know, Judge, they say justice is blind. I sure hope it ain't deaf. When there's a lot of money uh, and managers have a lot of power, uh, some of them uh, let the power go to their heads and, and they get carried away. That's not true by any means in all cases, but it's not infrequent in the entertainment business that entertainers are taken uh, advantage of uh, by those in positions uh, of power. When Trial Watch returns, Frank Weber tells his side of the story and tells why he feels Billy's wife, supermodel Christy Brinkley, is to blame. Billy Joel and Frank Weber were once the best of friends. Now Joel accuses his ex-brother-in-law of stealing $30 million. Weber says he didn't start the fire and points the finger at Billy's second wife, model Christy Brinkley. When I started working for Billy, he didn't even own all of his copyrights. So, uh, uh, under my direction, we reacquired all the rights to his uh, to his songs. Um, in addition, uh, I had negotiated a series of interest-free loans for Billy uh, from the record company. Um, instead of uh, him receiving advances, would he, uh, which he would have had to pay taxes on, and uh, thereby saving him millions of dollars in taxes. Frank Weber says he always acted in Billy Joel's best interest and was totally unprepared when he was hit with a lawsuit. I was in shock, obviously. Being sued for $90 million is not something that, uh, that one can comprehend. Billy used to say that, uh, you know, that he would take care of the, uh, uh, the music and I, and I would take care of the business. Frank denies claims he overcharged Billy for services he provided, such as videotaping the Russia tour. He says he kept Billy informed of all loans and investments, and that Billy took an active interest. Well, he used to ask me questions about, uh, you know, different things on the statements. Uh, you know, he would ask, you know, specifically some things would uh, come to his attention. Um, I don't recall specifically what they, what they were, but I know that at times I had to go and find things out for him. I just feel that Billy's been uh, purposely misinformed about a lot of things. And... Um, that at some point in time when he learns uh, when he learns the truth you know it's just important for me to uh, uh, to know at some point that uh, while he may never admit it he will know that uh, we did a good job for him Frank's wife and co-defendant Lucille believes she knows exactly where the source of Frank's problems lie Christy Brinkley would have liked to have had more control if not total control over her husband she would have liked to have m more say about the Korea decisions. We had a very close family relationship for many years, and then all of a sudden, I felt jealousy was in the picture. And this led her to want to get Frank out of the picture. And things more done to her liking. And, th and that's okay, but it certainly didn't have to be done this way. Frank has filed for bankruptcy, a move which Billy Joel's attorneys say has served to virtually prove Frank's misrepresentation. They say dozens of items Frank claimed to be virtually worthless in his bankruptcy papers are the same items he was telling Billy were worth a fortune. And we also found out that Weber had transferred various properties to his wife. We contend he did that in order to avoid creditors. Frank denies these charges and counters that the investments in question failed because of the recession and other factors. As for the trial, Frank says he's the underdog in this case, but expects to win. Well, it's difficult to, uh, you know, to fight uh, against uh, Billy Joel. I mean, he's a powerful guy. Um, he's got a lot of money in spite of what he says. And, uh, you know, we have very limited resources, but we're not going to quit. 
and uh, we're going to hang in there until uh, until this thing is resolved uh, favorably. So a court will decide who's the villain here, Frank and Lucille, or is it Billy and his uptown girl? <laughs> Billy Joel's attorneys say that while Frank Weber may be in bankruptcy, they feel they can still reclaim millions from others named in the suit. Next up on Trial Watch, the only thing that stood between Edward Vasquez and life in prison was a two-year-old burrito. When you visit a fast food restaurant, you want a meal that can be eaten quickly. But when Ed Vasquez bought a fast food burrito, he didn't eat it right away. Incredibly, two years later, that burrito turned up just in time to save him from going to prison for life. This parking lot, a security guard was killed, and I was blamed for it. I was uh, taking a trial. I was tried for it. I went to jail for it. It was here in the gang-ridden mean streets of Los Angeles that Ed Vasquez's nightmare began. He, his brother, and two friends had just bought a burrito at a fast food wagon when shots rang out. The security guard was standing about where that security guard is standing now. Um, he ran towards where we are now, and that is where uh, he met the uh, person who shot him. Also hit that fateful night, Ed, who ran bleeding to his friend's house across the street, and the gunman, who apparently ran in the opposite direction. There was a blood trail left by the uh, shooter, which the police uh, believed was my blood. Because when I was shot, I did bleed, but fortunately, I didn't leave a blood trail. Instead of being a victim, the police turned him into a suspect. Jay Jaffe is a veteran criminal lawyer who defended Ed. He says the case never should have gone to trial. The physical evidence at the scene just was not consistent with what the witnesses said. I honestly believe that the police uh, uh, arrived at the wrong conclusion and then looked to certain facts which would support their conclusion rather than conducting an objective evaluation of this case. Ed Vasquez stood charged with murder. During the trial, witnesses gave different versions of what happened. No one seemed to agree on who was wearing what. The prosecution said Ed wasn't wearing a jacket, but Ed produced the green one he had on when he was shot. I did not want the jury to get the idea that since there was not blood on the bottom part of the jacket, for them to conclude that maybe he wasn't wearing the jacket. As I tried it on, the jury was able to see that the jacket was only a waist length and that where the bullet had struck me was approximately three to four inches beneath the waist of the jacket. When I tried it on in court, I felt something heavy in the pocket. It took Ed a while to figure out the importance of his discovery. The jacket had been in a police evidence locker up to that point and no one had looked in the pocket. When I saw tin foil, I knew exactly what that was. That was the covering on the, for the food preparation uh, of the, the burrito that he purchased at the lunch wagon, which, as far as I was concerned, proved conclusively our alibi. Jury members deliberated Ed's fate for five days, when suddenly they were called back to the courtroom for the startling new evidence. Ed's jacket and the burrito that would support his innocence. It just helped to corroborate um, feelings of, um, or feeling that, that he was innocent. Um, it helped to support in my mind anyways the, the um, acquittal. The jury was eight to four for acquittal before they were given this new information about the burrito being in the pocket. For those eight, I think it solidified their feeling that they were going to acquit Eddie Vasquez. As to the other four, I think it raised enough doubt in their minds so that they also agreed with the eight in, in the majority. But this case is not over for Ed Vasquez. Now, instead of being the one on trial, Ed is taking the L.A. District Attorney's Office and the police department to court. He says his family has been broken financially by the $150,000 spent on his defense. But more than that, it cost him his fiance and his baby daughter. I know that uh, as a result of this, uh, my relationship didn't work out. But unfortunately, I also 
lost a, a lot of experiences with my daughter that I should have had, I could have had if I hadn't been going through this. Ed Vasquez told Trial Watch that he's always been fond of burritos, but now they're his favorite food. And next on Trial Watch, their ancestors were freed slaves. Now these islanders are fighting the Civil War all over again. The Civil War ended 125 years ago, but some of its bitterness and resentments never died. Now they're flaring up again on a serene island off the coast of South Carolina. There, the descendants of freed slaves are fighting to preserve their way of life from developers who are intent on restoring the privileged lifestyle of the plantation. For generations, Defusky Island was a refuge for African-American culture. After the Civil War, it was home to 1,200 ex-slaves, a world unto itself with no paved roads. The island survived despite the encroaching modern world. Defusky's humble existence has exacted a price. The lure of a better life on the mainland has reduced the population to 180 residents, only a quarter of them black. But are white developers trying to destroy the island's remaining black culture? I think first and foremost it's a class, it's a money, it's a rich versus poor issue. But just like in larger society, those inequalities of money disproportionately impact on people of color. The problem started several years ago when construction began on Melrose, a private resort styled in a plantation motif. Membership fees start at $50,000. We don't know exactly what the surroundings do we? <laughs> Since then, property values on the island have skyrocketed. Both white and black residents began to see their lifestyle slip away. Right here is a green. I, I got big these some some of the green. The green right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. Here on the banks of the Cooper River is where Defusky's black community has always buried their dead. But there are charges that when the resort was built, the Welcome Center was constructed over half the graveyard. That was the only section of, of grave that they, they could identify there with the headstones, right? But we know for a fact that our graveyard was all over this whole area here. Right from the all the way back the over here, including the house. Come on, Liv. Come on. Wick Scurry, son of one of the developers, denies any wrongdoing. I have seen no proof at all that it's over a cemetery. And it, if for some reason uh, it's in fact true, we're absolutely appalled. It's the last thing in the world my family would ever do. And I do not like the way the press has portrayed it as though if something was done wrong, it was done on purpose. According to documents dating back to the late 1800s, the parcel of land the Melrose Resort bought was described as being bordered by the cemetery, and the cemetery seems to have shrunk over the years. Many people couldn't afford headstones, so it became unclear just where the cemetery began. Lawyers for residents claim the developers made their own boundary. They just grabbed it. It's a land theft. They knew they were building on the cemetery. They just thought they could get away with it. And they did get away with it until finally people found the resources and the courage enough to confront them. I would like to point out that if it was stolen, it was stolen by a black man, not a white man. Because that's who we bought it from. But several black residents have filed suit in federal court charging the Melrose developers knowingly and illegally built on an established cemetery. At a news conference, they announced they're demanding the Welcome Center be moved. That house is over my grandmother's grave. Move. This is not the first time the Melrose Resort has been in court involving a cemetery dispute. There's another graveyard on Defusky, one used mostly by whites. Melrose said it had been abandoned. Several residents spent $11,000 on legal fees to fight and beat the developer. Can you believe this? I, I, I just, I cannot. I still can't even believe that they even would haul us up in court and say that we didn't use it anymore. Well, just like they're saying about the Cooper River. It's abandoned land, you know. It makes you wonder, where is the integrity anymore? The Melrose is just one part of a $500 million plan to develop the island over the next 20 years. That will bring as many as 20,000 full-time residents to Defusky, making it impossible to preserve the unique culture of the island. 
Well, they say nobody's born a criminal, but today's snap judgment is about someone who was born an outlaw. Lisa? The name game was recently played in a New York courtroom when Archie Outlaw went on trial. The 34-year-old outlaw was charged with selling narcotics to an undercover police officer. He asked the judge for permission to change his name during the trial, arguing that the name Outlaw could prejudice his case. Archie suggested he be called Reggie Jackson, Eleanor Roosevelt, or even Archie Lawful, anything but his real name. Judge Robert Haft agreed to consider the request for a name change. Now you be the judge. Is an outlaw by any other name a fair trial? I'll have the answer right after this. So Lisa, could Archie change his name? Yes, as a matter of fact, he could. Judge Robert Haft agreed the name outlaw might hurt Archie's chances for a fair trial, but he wouldn't let Archie call himself Reggie Jackson or even Archie Lawful. So they finally compromised on Archie Simmons. Very nice ring to it. That's good. All right, that's it for today. Join us again tomorrow for Trial Watch.